Our conviction to be more organized and orderly as a fellowship of believers, first and foremost, comes from the scriptures. It has to. We are a church. We are a fellowship of believers. Everything we do must come from the authority of scripture. And so orderliness comes first from that. So this morning, from the scriptures, I want to make the case for orderliness. And moving forward, I want us all to be on the same page and committed to this orderliness, this biblical orderliness together. Second, I want to also suggest some practical ways that you individually, personally, in your family, and in your dealings, uh, suggest some ways that you can possibly be more orderly in your life as well. And believe me, this is all, I'm speaking to myself on this one. When it, if there's anybody who needs to hear a sermon on orderliness, it's me. On industriousness, it's, it's me. And so uh, this is mostly for me, and I hope that you get something out of it as well. But finally, I want to share uh, what me and the elders, we had this uh, elders meeting just recently, and we've come up with a basic structure and order that we'd like to share with you so that everybody's on the same page as we move forward. There are many projects and ideas that many of us in this church have started and have left unfinished. Um, not only for months, but for years. There are some projects that were done years ago that are half done and still waiting to be done. There are ministry ideas that are in a folder that are half completed and not put into practice. But it's time that we finish what we started. And so that's going to be our big desire. So let's begin. Let's talk about chaos and order. Let's first pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's a guiding light and principle for us to follow, that you did not leave us alone. You did not create us, set us, and forget us. But God, that you have spoken to us through creation. You have spoken to us by your inspired word, the Holy Scriptures. So I pray now in this hour, God, that you would uh, teach us by your Holy Spirit. Teach us about order and chaos. Help us understand the importance of getting our lives and our things in order and uh, help us to avoid chaos. So, Father, teach us that. May this become something that affects us personally and affects us as a community of believers, uh, all for the betterment of this world and our community, all for the, the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The opposite of order is chaos, and chaos is an unavoidable fixture of this fallen world. In our lives, we will either learn to overcome chaos, or chaos will overcome us. The English Dictionary defines chaos as complete disorder and confusion. The Bible does not have anything good to say about disorder or confusion. Therefore, I want to begin by establishing the fact that chaos, or complete disorder and confusion, is the symptom of a serious problem, ultimately the symptom of sin, and is something that God does not want for any of his children. First of all, disorder. Have you ever come across a mess like in your garage or somewhere else where you think to yourself, where did this come from? How did this get here? What does this belong to? Is it even useful? Should I throw it away? And then how do you respond to that? Well, I'll deal with that tomorrow. Or do you dig right in and you figure it out and you put things where they're supposed to go? Well. I wanted to play a quick game, and I want to see how good you guys are identifying uh, messes. So let's start with the first one. No, that's not right. <laughs> that's a worship song. We know that. That's scripture. That's not a mess. Speaking of chaos. What are we looking for? Oh, yeah. Go, go to the next one. Go to the next one. There we go. Okay, that's it. All right. Is that just a, a mess of things, or what is that? What's that? A Chevy? You nailed it. You nailed it. That's a 2009 Chevy Corvette LS9 6.2 liter V8 engine, and that's 
the engine disassembled. It's very organized. It's very, <laughs> surprisingly, it's very organized. If I were to walk up onto that, I would, uh, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, <laughs> I'd probably call one of you guys and ask you to come tell me what this is. Yeah, but man, well done, John. You got it. You, you even got the, the make, so that's good. Okay, let's do the next one. Did you say AK-47? Not quite. AR-15. AR-15, yeah. That's, I think that's the common favorite gun among, among you guys, right? I know many of you have one. I don't yet. So my birthday is coming up September 30th. And I don't have an AR-15. Not yet. Okay, how about the next one? Junk drawer. <laughs> Absolutely. That's junk, keychains. Okay, that you can't assemble out for nothing. Okay, what's the next one? Okay, we got speakers. Digital camera. Digital camera is correct. That's what it is. Uh, we got a couple more. Next one. Those are all the components that make up a PC computer. Graphics card, you got the fan in there, bits of RAM. See, that, that I know. That I know. Uh, one more. Let's see if this one's kind of hard. Let's see if you can do this one. Wow. You got that right away. That's a Rolex Caliber 3135. I believe it's a, no, it's, it's not a stopwatch. It's actually the face of, of the watch. So when disassembled, these parts might seem kind of chaotic, messy, you're not quite sure where things go, but when a skilled and an orderly person assembles them the right way, they create tools that are useful to us. And all things made into something useful start out looking sort of spread out and disorderly. You need someone to bring it together and make it useful. I want to begin, and if you go back to the uh, Genesis scripture, I want to begin looking at creation. Before the days of creation, God made the substance of the earth and the stars and the sky and all that's in creation, but he did not immediately have it in order. In this state, the elements had no order, no purpose. They simply were there. God just made the stuff of life, the stuff of earth. And then, of course, uh, Genesis 1-2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And if you look throughout scriptures, typically when darkness is used, it's used to define chaos, disorder, there's no structure, or it's a mess, right? And so darkness is typically defined that way. But for a moment, the substance of God's creation was in chaos, but then God brought immediate order to this chaos during his seven days of creation. If you look at uh, the creation model, we see the seven days of creation. In day one, he separated light from the dark. And so he brought order by creating light, let there be light. Day two, he separated the clouds from water, the expanses he separated. Day three, he gathered water. He formed land and he uh, grew plants. Day four, sun, moon, and stars were created. Day five, birds of the air, fish of the sea. Day six, man and land animals. And finally, day seven, God rested. So God's creation, even at the very beginning of all life, God's creation was intended to serve multiple purposes. Number one, to bring order to what was chaos but also to give us time, days, weeks, months, years, and so on. And so God established order, the order of natural life, with everything that you see in it, including the time that we keep. And at the end of this creation, before the fall of man, before the temptation of Satan, God said, it is all good. He said, it is all very good. And so therefore, we must come to the conclusion 
that even order itself in God's original design is good, not only good, but very good. Consider also morals and ethics. Consider Moses. When God called Israel to escape the Egyptians from captivity, and they were wandering in the desert, God called Moses up to Mount Sinai to give him the Ten Commandments, which the people Israel would keep. The Ten Commandments are the written code of the morals and the ethics that God has already, at that point, put into the hearts of every man. We know this even now today that the commandments, the morals and ethics of God are implanted into every person upon birth. There's no excuse in any individual to not act according to God's morals and ethics because it's something that was planted within us. Of course, the more you sin against that internal moral and, and code of ethic, the more, the more your conscience becomes seared, the more things become backwards. Good becomes evil, evil becomes good. But it, every person has this implanted. And we know this, of course, because Romans 2, 14 through 15 says, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So it's important to note that every one of us has God's code of morals and ethics written on our hearts. Consider the Ten Commandments, if you will. The first commandment, there is only one God. The second, do not make idols. The third, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, do not murder. Number seven, do not commit adultery. Number eight, do not steal. Number nine, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10, do not covet. And all these things, if you even talk to a non-believer, most non-believers will agree with most of these things. Of course, they'll have problem with the God aspect of things. But yet, within them, they have this sense and this knowledge that these things are good and these things are right and really take somebody actively working against these things uh, to dismiss them. So Moses, after we received this code of ethics and law, which was designed to bring order and stability to the community of Israel, he comes down the hill and what does he find? After 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai, he comes down and his brother Aaron had, with the people, resurrected a golden calf, an idol for them to worship. And he comes down and he hears this sound of music. And he sees people dancing and it all, all in chaos. Imagine, if you will, coming to, um, to Woodstock, right? You come into Woodstock and you see all these people, these ladies with these flowers in their hair and they're, they're dancing and a guy who doesn't know what, he, what he's doing. You know, and they're, they're banging on tambourines and just kind of kind of chaos. I mean, if you're on drugs, then it's like, yeah, I'm at home. But, but if you're a sober person, you come into this, you're like, what is happening here? This is just a mess, you know. And so he comes down to this, this party, this chaos, this music, worshiping this golden calf. After he just had 40 days of enlightenment and, and fellowship with the Lord on top of the mountain. So he's coming down literally on a mountaintop, and he comes to this. Parents, how many times have you just had a great moment, a great day at work? You come on home and there's just chaos. How often has that happened? A lot. If you're a parent, that has happened. So you can feel the way that Moses probably felt when he came down. He viewed everybody as his children. And so what did he do? He took those tablets. He threw them down. He said, I have 15 commandments. And he dropped one of them. Ten. Ten commandments. Then he threw down the Ten Commandments, broke them at the foot of the idol, and of course he had to set things in order because things were out of order. Uh, in his absence, things got out of control. Um, thankfully, as a pastor, I can take one weekend off. Brad can do a great job preaching the sermon. I come back and things are... You haven't erected any kind of idols. There's no strip, strip poles anywhere. Um, you guys, we're doing good, and I'm happy about that. But Moses... 
with Israel. It didn't work out that way. So God establishes and established a basic moral code for all mankind, which Jesus sums up in these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and all the prophets are summed up in those two basic rules. So even just those two rules, you think about Adam and Eve in the garden, they had the one rule. Even in the garden, rules and regulations were necessary. Unfortunately, even with one rule, mankind could not keep it. With ten rules, mankind could not keep it. Going into specifics and doing over 900 laws in the Old Testament Levitical Code, Israel could not keep it. In fact, they added a bunch of their own on top of that. It's kind of like in America. We're getting sick and tired of all these legislation and rules and regulations. Hold on to your straws, people, because... That straw law is coming to Washington, I guarantee you. Um, just all these different rules, the, the logging, the grazing, the things like that, that make it possible for these forest fires to just explode. It's just incredible. So we add all these laws, um, but even with a billion laws, even with one law, we cannot keep it. However, that does not mean that we shouldn't continue to at least have common sense, basic uh, laws that are meant to provide a unified moral code and ethic. And of course, as believers, the Bible is our standard of righteous living. It's how we know how to please God. It's how we know uh, what is expected of us. And so as a church, as long as we live by the code and ethic provided by the scriptures, then we're doing all right. But as soon as we start to let those things slide, as soon as we start to erect idols, to dismiss certain passages because, well, it's, it was a cultural thing. It, it doesn't apply to us today. And that's when we start slipping into chaos and disorder. I also want to talk about uh, disorder when it comes to uh, governing principles or corporate. And when I say corporate, I just mean a group of people trying to accomplish a task. So in a workplace, you're, you're a corporate group. You know, you're trying to sell this or create that. In a church, same thing. We, we are a corporate entity in the fact that we are all coming together to um, pursue Christ and to pursue the kingdom of God on earth. And so that's, that's what we're doing. We are a corporate group. And what the Bible tells us to do is that we need to submit to all governing authorities. There are all kinds of authorities that we can be under in this life. Obviously, God is an authority above all else. He trumps all other authorities on life in life. But God also, he talks specifically about governing authority, statesmen. Consider Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And he, and he erected this golden idol and he said, everybody at this time of day and this time of day, you need to stop what you're doing and worship this golden idol. Well, uh, these Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we will not. We will not. Um, and, but we are willing to submit to whatever punishment that you deem necessary, O King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, you have conflicted the one law that we are not willing to participate because it offends our God and he is our highest authority. But we will take whatever punishment. The punishment, of course, was the furnace, and they willfully went into the furnace, and there with them was Christ Jesus who saved them and delivered them from death by fire. And of course, this was very uh, impactful to King Nebuchadnezzar, who then became a believer himself and very influential during his time period. So even in their situation, they ultimately submitted to governing authority, even though they were unwilling to follow that one law. They submitted to the punishment. Christ himself says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Who's on that coin of yours? Well, that's Caesar. Well, if he's asking for taxes, then give him taxes. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. Also, Romans 13 lays it out very plainly. Submit to your governing authority because every authority under heaven has been established by God. God allows wicked kings to reign for a time. 
and he uproots the wicked king in the proper time. He allows for good kings to come in and to create order out of what was made chaos. God allows roots, God appoints. God is in charge of the governing authorities. Parents, it's the fifth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. Give them the respect that is due to them as your parents. This is the first commandment with a promise, and it will go well with you. What about masters? In times of slavery, whether indentured or any other kind of slavery, God calls for the slaves to give their masters their due respect and honor, even if they're wrongfully a slave. In today's standard, many of you who work consider your boss your slave master, right? Some of you feel like slaves to your work. You have a mortgage to pay, you have kids to feed, a wife's um, desire for fashion to satisfy, and you feel like a slave to your job in order to do those things. And the Bible tells us, submit to your authority. You know, oftentimes I think about leadership, and as, as a pastor for the last six years or so, um, I've made many observations, not only here, but through other uh, ways as well. But what I've found is that it seems to me those who are most disrespectful towards authority, uh, those who complain the most about authority and the way things are done, if given the opportunity to be in authority themselves, usually end up becoming a tyrant or just a horrible leader. The first step of becoming a good leader is learning how to serve and submit yourself. And it's reciprocal because once you're elevated to a position of leadership, then you understand that principle. You understand what works with leadership, what doesn't work with leadership. And so in your workplace, wherever you're at in church, it's important to remember what the scripture says because also the scripture talks specifically about elders. It says, do everything that uh, your elders say. Give them all of your money. Buy them, um, <laughs> buy them AR-15s for their birthday. Uh, not really. It does say that um, don't make our work miserable. You know, we're, we're here to oversee and help the church and just uh, don't give us too much of a hard time. So corporate disorder, James 3.16, he talks about this. He says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Jealousy and selfishness are counter to peace and lead people into all kinds of disorder. You see this in any corporate group. Jealousy, selfish ambition, you know, people wanting to be in high positions, uh, people uh, selfishly wanting to impose their own will instead of the will of the collective or the will of the scriptures themselves. And so this is a part of disorder. This creates disorder. Consider what Paul said to the Corinthian church. He wrote, I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish, that perhaps there may be, may be a quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. So Paul feared this, coming back to the Corinthian church. So in every situation where there is a group of people trying to accomplish something, with leaders given the authority to lead, order is necessary in order to succeed. You must have some standard of order. And consider that even within the triune nature of God, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who does Christ, when he walked in his ministry on earth, who did Christ submit to? He submitted to the Father. And who does the Holy Spirit submit to? Who was the Holy Spirit sent by? Jesus Christ. So even within the triune nature of God, there is this triangle of submission that takes place. God is one, but yet each individual person or expression of God submits to another. So even if in the person of God, if God can submit in that way, and we ought to submit to God, we should also submit to one another. The scripture says in the church, we're to submit to one another. And what this looks like is that I may be a pastor, I may be an elder, but still with the older men here, I still submit to you. You submit to me as a pastor, I submit to you as an older man, uh, older women, 
Uh, even Brad and I kind of dealt with this because Brad Co and Kerry Co are now the youth pastors of our church. They're already doing an awesome job. They've had like a couple parties already. Um, doing really good. But we talked about this where I'm overseeing youth ministries as a senior pastor. And <clears throat> Brad and I are both elders. So when he's in the mode of youth pastor, he submits to me as the director of or overseer of youth ministries. But then when it comes to things like holding me accountable as a pastor, are you doing your duties throughout the week? I submit to him and to Kevin and to Frank. And so you see, we submit to one another. It just depends on what role you're in, uh, where you're at. Age does come into factor sometimes. So the Bible is clearly calling for us to have order. Because if we don't have order, if things are in disarray and disorder, then that creates confusion. And 1 Corinthians 14.33 says very specifically, specifically, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And I want to implant in you this morning the importance of context. Because when it says God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, what is the context there? What, what is he talking about that leads up to this, therefore, to this God is not a God of confusion, but peace? If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 14. I want to begin in just verse 23. We'll read 10 verses. 1 Corinthians 14, 23. It says, If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders and unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are all out of your minds? But if all prophecy and an unbeliever, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation? Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two, or at the most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and be encouraged, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So the context there is actually talking about utilizing and using our gifts as a church to build up the church, to build up one another. And so when we talk about order, when we talk about uh, not being in confusion, there were a few circumstances growing up and attending uh, different Pentecostal-type churches where you'd walk in and it seemed to be in utter chaos and confusion. You're wondering what is going on here. People are hanging from the rafters, ladies running around with the tambourine, that gives you a little insight about why the tambourine is banned here at Clayton Community Church, um, except for sanctioned tambourine playing. But I've seen videos of certain so-called revivals where people uh, walk into this building and there's people crawling around like dogs, barking like dogs on the ground, where people are even attached leashes to people and walk around and where there's this strange laughter of the Holy Spirit, where people are laughing uncontrollably. Imagine, if you will, maybe you've been in a circumstance like this. Imagine being somebody who's not a believer, and they hear about this church, and they come in, they're like, well, I want to find out what God's all about. And they come in, and they see all these people crawling like dogs and barking, and then people laughing hysterically, falling on the ground, getting blankets thrown on them, and oil splashing everywhere. And then you see a guy up front, you know, he's like knocking people over. He's knocking people over. I mean, imagine being a non-believer. How are they going to view that? I mean, you might as well go to a, a Comic-Con or something. That's, that's what they do there. They, they walk around like dogs. They dress up. <laughs> they dre it, it's the same thing. But in the name of Jesus, people are hurt and wanting to find out what God has for them. They see that and they think, um, these people are 
weird, and this is wrong. So as a church, it's important that when we use our gifts, that we use them in an orderly way, that we do not let it get out of control and uh, into chaos. At Clayton Community Church, we believe in the gifts. We are not cessationists. We believe that the gifts exist today, but that they are used according to the mandate in Scripture, and that they are to be used in order. There are some of you here who speak in tongues and use that as a private uh, prayer edification. Um, there are some of you here who uh, you know, are very sensitive to uh, prophetic utterances. But the reason why things are, are managed well is because we stick to the Scriptures. We keep order of all the gifts, and it's not a free-for-all. And so as a church, we must do this. So hopefully you are convinced that order is a part of all life, that it's good, that it's very good, that it's something God intends for believers. Consider in Romans 11.8, where Paul quotes Isaiah 29.10, God gave them a spirit of stupor. These are rebellious people against God. Eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. So if we are to be a people who are kept in order, we must be people who are humbled before the Lord, seeking the Lord, serving the Lord. Otherwise, God gives us over into a spirit of confusion and stupor. So finally, um, 1 Corinthians 14 says, all things should be done decently and in order. So what does that look like in our personal life? Well, you know, from talking to many people, most people don't want to live in chaos. Even when you talk to people who are living in chaos, they don't want to be there. Um, and there's many reasons why they are there. Some are valid reasons. They've just had a, a long series of unfortunate events that have led to this point. And they just feel like the pressure and the weight of the chaos and the mess and the disorder is just so heavy that it's so hard to get out of that they don't even try. But when you talk to them, they, they do say that, yeah, I hate living like this. I hate living in this filth and this mess, mess and this chaos and not keeping a calendar. I hate not knowing what's going to happen next. So most people I've talked to feel that way, but they just can't get out of it. A lot of people say, I'm too tired. I deserve a break. I'll do it tomorrow. They put it off. But experts suggest that there's an easy way for us to get out of this mindset. If that's you this morning... If you just feel crushed by the pressure of chaos and you want a way out, one thing experts say, and it's very simple, is just start by developing a few just basic, responsible, orderly habits. Charles Duhigg notes in his popular book, The Power of Habit, he says, making your bed every morning is correlated with better productivity, a greater sense of well-being, and stronger skills at sticking with a budget. So this is a good kickstart to your day. And you might think, well, what does making a bed have to do with any of that? Well, it's the first thing you do in the morning. You wake up and you make it a point to develop that habit. I'm going to make my bed. I don't care if anybody else is going to see it, but this is the one thing I'm going to do. You make your bed. And then it kind of kickstarts you. It kind of gets you in the mood. It starts to feel good after a while, after you do it. So that when you don't do it, you feel something is amiss. And so that kind of picks up steam, and you, you decide, well, I'm going to go do some dishes, too, and that feels good. Well, I'm going to go balance my checkbook. Well, that felt really good. That garage that's in chaos that I've been meaning to organize, you know, I have a couple hours. I'm going to do that today. Get it done. So developing small habits has been proven to help us with the larger pile of crap that we're dealing with. There you go, Brad. That one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> Proverbs 24, 30 through 34 says, I pass by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles and its stone, was, stone wall was broken down. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So begin small in your personal life. Decide yourself one thing that you're going to do that's productive, that's small, 
and do it every day. And from there, it'll just become natural to do more. So decide for yourself. That's personally. That hopefully will translate into your family life. Every family has a different degree of orderliness that they maintain. And that's got to be up to you and your family. My wife, she has very high expectations for cleanliness and order. She likes to keep a very specific calendar with uh, dates that are marked out weeks in advance. Um, for me, I'm a little more, little more carefree than that. But what I've found out is that because she notices a mess uh, far sooner than I do, messes bother me too. But she notices them first, always, always. And even if I would notice it 20 seconds later, the problem is she's always the one to point out the mess and say we need to clean it up. And what that does for her is that she feels like she is always the one pointing things out. She's the only one who cares. Well, honey, I'm just lagging 20 seconds behind. I can put up with the mess a little bit longer than you. It bothers me too, but it doesn't bother me as much. And by the way, some of you are laughing. I can tell that that's in your relationship as well. Typically, one person always seems to be the one to point out messes. Well, again, we notice mess too. But what that's going to do is that that's going to create this um, tension there. My wife and I have had this tension, this argument over and over again. The one argument that we always end up yelling at each other, each other for once a quarter has to do with chores, who's doing them, our level of expectation for cleanliness, and it's just a, a bad cycle. But we're starting to learn a little bit about each other. We're starting to learn how do we maintain this order without driving each other crazy. How do I convince my wife to take it easy a little bit? Let's have a little bit of fun today. Not everything has to be work and productive. Let's enjoy the Sabbath. Remember the Bible talks about the Sabbath? Let's have a Sabbath today, all right? And if the ox falls in a ditch, we'll pick it up. But hey, come on, let's just, let's enjoy our day. And then tomorrow we can address that pile, okay? So in a family, it's important that you come to an agreement on orderliness. It's important that you provide a stable, firm foundation for your kids, that they're not living in filth, that they're not constantly wondering if they're going to have a bed to sleep in tomorrow. They're not constantly wondering what's going to happen. There's tension here. You know, I think about adoption. Adoption, uh, my wife and I are, are done having kids. She has heart problems to the point where we can't have our own kids. But the Lord has really been speaking to me about adoption lately. And I keep thinking about just what a, a, a great thing that is to take some child who's living in total chaos, doesn't know who their parents are going to be, doesn't know where they are going to live, just no solid ground to stand on. But taking one human life, giving them that stability, giving them order in their life, giving them a chance to succeed, to me, there, that seems like, it seems like there's nothing better than that. And so that's something I'm prayerfully considering. I'd encourage you to as well. Uh, fin finally, that should translate into church life as well. And I want to close by sharing, this is something that we came up with, where the buck stops, so where is the final accountability for all these things? Listed are the elders of Clay Community Church and the areas of church ministry we are committed to oversee and take full responsibility for the discipling, directing, and delegating of all corresponding activities and pers personnel therein. Brad, as we mentioned, youth group director, that's both Brad and Carrie are directing that. Um, that is a huge task. That's why it's the only thing there. Although many of you remember, when we uh, confirmed Brad as an elder, he did also commit to making our coffee great again. <laughs> he ran on the slogan, make coffee great again. And many people voted in favor for Brad off of that premise. So we're, we're still waiting for the coffee to be great again. It's not great. <laughs> It's okay. It's kind of sludgy, but um, <laughs> so we're expecting you to fall through that. But youth group, all things youth group, run through Brad. Uh, he oversees the youth group on Wednesdays and any other day. Myself, preaching and teaching, which I'm doing now. Any kind of preaching and teaching that happens um, as sanctioned by the church, uh, I oversee. Youth ministries, Sunday school, after school, VBS, 
including youth group, I oversee. I talked about that a little bit. Uh, worship, praise music, and, you know, from my heart to yours, my desire is to uh, give up worship, lead to somebody else. I, I still would oversee it, but as far as uh, being up here every Sunday and leading a team, um, I'd like to give that up to somebody else, but the right person has not come along. And so prayerfully as a church, if you'd pray with me about that, uh, for a, a worship director to come, that's what we need. Also, missions, which is uh, changing hands. Judy, who's been doing it for years uh, and has done a great job maintaining that, uh, she has passed that on over to Steve Obert for the time being, and that's something we're working on as well, uh, looking for people to be involved in, in missions. Church offices, ordering supplies as needed. Now, I'm not in charge of the administrative, but I am in charge of ordering supplies because I have a church credit card. So, for example, our printer this morning ran out of ink, so I need to go and make sure we have ink stocked up and supplied. Gene, if you need anything, if you need pens, pins, whatever, um, come and talk to me. If any of, any of you in the offices need any supplies, I can order that. In fact, this little guy was broken, and the soundboard team called me up and said, hey, we need to order some of those. So I hopped on, I ordered them. We got them last night. So now I'm using it. So anyway, that all goes for me. Uh, and ushers as well. That's something that is a work in progress. We don't technically have ushers, but we have people who come and who help out with usher duties uh, just without the name tags and the fancy stuff. So, but that's something we're working on as well. Frank, <laughs> uh, vice chairman, he oversees the building and maintenance, which also involves kitchen, day-to-day, and kind of the, some of the major projects. So he's working closely with Bucky, who's our day-to-day -day building and maintenance guy, making sure the lights are in, the, the lawn is mowed, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's Frank's deal. Who's our chairman, who uh, is required to take a year's sabbatical come November. He is overseeing meetings, which is the board meetings and the elder meetings, and also the admin, uh, which includes working with uh, the vice chairman, which is Frank, working with uh, the treasurer, which is Gene, and working with the secretary, which is his wife, which he, uh, you work with her every day. So that works out. So that is the way that we have decided uh, as elders and as the church to do a better job of organizing and keeping things in order. So if you are a part or want to be a part of any of those ministries, that is kind of, if you will, the chain of command, or I like to say the chain of communication. This is how we communicate. This is how we get stuff done. Uh, next up. That's messed up. <laughs> and so each one of us specifically has a checklist. This is what I'm going to do. Each week, I'm going to go through my checklist, and I'm going to make sure and be in contact with everybody who I am helping to oversee. That way, we're in constant communication. And the value of that is, for example, I had a meeting at McDonald's with my sound and tech crew, and uh, the kids were playing, and we were meeting at McDonald's, and we had this great meeting. We all left very encouraged. I got here this morning. All of the sound and tech people were here, and they had cleaned up the soundboard, and they were just like on fire just doing stuff. So just the value of constant communication, constantly working together, it's good. It's just like when I think of God and creation and just taking disorder and making it into order and saying it's good. It's very good. So Clayton Community Church, I would like to encourage you, now that summer is coming to a close, let's all come together and let's all make a surge and let's be orderly together and let's really make an impact for the kingdom of God here in this community, in your families and in your personal life. Let's agree to do that together. Let's be one in this effort. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this valuable time that we get to spend together. None of us know if we're going to be here tomorrow. And so we treasure, we value this fellowship. We do look forward to our eternity in heaven. Uh, we long to be in our heavenly tent, but God, you have given us a task to do here in our earthly tent. And so, Lord, we just ask that in the meantime, you would help us to be more orderly. You'd help us to um, get rid of the confusion, to communicate. Help us to be good stewards of what you have given us. I thank you for the gifts and the talents that you've given us. 
Help us all to find them and to use them to better this community and to better uh, to bring about your kingdom, God. And so we love you. We thank you. And please be with all these people as they go about their day and their week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.